Okay, um, well, uh, good evening uh, and uh, warm welcome to you um, to this, the, the first of four um, technical seminars that we're running weekly over the next month. Um, so this event is part of the reporting process uh, of a year-long project looking to develop a results-based approach to supporting the sustainable management of common land. Uh, my name is Gwyn Jones uh, and I'm the manager of the project. Um, so the project's going to end on the 31st of October um, and it's been funded by a leader. It's a leader cooperation project funded by six local action groups um, here in Wales uh, and co-funded by Natural Resources Wales. Um, we will have a final conference event uh, online on the 12th of October. Um, but we thought that having more um, detailed technical sessions on some of the technical issues um, allowed us to make that a, a rather more open, perhaps less heavy event. Um, so the reason um, for the project in the first place um, was the clear message in the West Government. Was the clear message in the Welsh Government, um, Brexit and our land um, consultation paper, um, that they uh, wanted to establish a new and flexible public goods scheme. Um, that's what they said. And the scheme, they said, will enable land managers um, to be paid um, to, uh, to be paid for the production of outcomes um, for which there's currently no market. Um, so having had experience of working with colleagues um, who've devised such measures in the past, um, it was very clear that this requires a lot of careful design, uh, and all the more so in Wales because this was proposed and is proposed as the sole real means of support for farmers in future. Um, experience also shows, I think, that um, common land, with all its extra complications, is always an afterthought in these policy development processes. Um, not just in Wales, but almost universally. Um, and since common land is a very important part of semi-natural heritage of Wales um, and to its most um, extensive farming systems, we saw a gap there where we thought we might be able to um, add value. And so we're very grateful to the funders um, for supporting us in that endeavour. Uh, and of course, what um, works on common land should also work on the sole use mountain land next door, for example. Um, so I'm just going to start my presentation. Um, and then we'll get going. Okay. Can you all see that? I hope so. Uh, okay. Uh, so a lot has happened um, since the Welsh Government made that initial um, policy statement um, in Brexit and land. Um, there's been a lot of subtle changes to what they've been saying. Um, but in the um, forward plan that they issued just um, this week. Um, they reiterate again how important they think common land is um, for public good delivery in Wales. Um, and how few ideas, I think it's fair to say, that there are um, on how it might be um, taken forward within this new um, scheme framework. Um, and so there's very much, I think, a, a gap there um, where this project uh, can potentially uh, give a useful input uh, and we very much hope that the government will be interested in taking it forward. Um, so just to outline what I hope to talk about this evening. Um, so obviously we're in a bit of an introduction and that's going to go on for a slide or two. Uh, then we'll talk about um, what public goods are just to remind ourselves if we need that. Um, and then we'll think about what public goods um, we considered and we'll go through those public goods one by one. Um, to try and set out what's good and what's bad about um, a common uh, in regard of those public goods. Um, and then we'll think about how to bring them together. We'll do that as we go, perhaps a bit. Um, so how consistent are they with each other? How much conflict is there between them? How much compromise do you have to make between them? Um, and then at the end, we'll summarise the conclusions. Okay. Um, so tonight we're only going to talk about this um, public goods issue and how to um, bring public goods together into a consistent message. Uh, and so the overall aim of the bit of the work we're talking about tonight is to construct from all 
the policy goals that we can find that relate to all the relevant public goods, a single set of clear messages. Um, and that those clear messages um, are appropriate um, <coughs> for any circumstance uh, we can meet on the commons of the project area. Okay. There's some people um, not muted their mics. If they can mute their mics, that'd be good. Um, so just uh, to reiterate the point I made earlier in passing, um, that this uh, adventure that the West government is setting us on is something really very new. It's never been tried before anywhere, um, and it's a major challenge. Um, so if you consider what the situation is in Ireland in the upcoming new version of the CAP, it looks something like uh, here on the left. Um, so uh, at the bottom, there's regulation. That's the same everywhere. Um, and then there's a new BPS, which is called BIS. And then there's an area of natural constraints, so an LFA scheme. Um, and then there's the eco scheme that's going to sit on top of that. And then on top of everything is agri-environment and climate measures. Um, and in Ireland, a certain proportion is already results-based, and that will increase. Um, that's the proposal. Um, but even then, it won't be by any means all of agri-environment and climate measures. There's still a lot of traditional approaches there. Um, I've been doing some work in Scotland in the last couple of years. Um, I used to work there. Um, and the situation in Scotland is much more conservative than in Wales, and um, with a small C, of course. Um, and so just now, farmers in Scotland, they get BPS. Um, they also have an LFA scheme. Um, there's also um, a couple of payments for um, suckler producers and for um, sheep producers in the most marginal areas. And then on top of that, there's an AECM scheme. Um, and whether or not Scotland takes forward a, a results-based approach, I think we can be fairly sure that that also will be just a, a minor part or a small part or a large part, but just a part of the, the total ACM budget. Um, whereas what's been considered in Wales, of course, is completely different. Um, so as the Sustainable Farming Scheme has to do all the work. Whatever work government wants done by um, support payments to farmers, which aren't to do with training or whatever, it has to be done by SFS. Um, and that's a really, really big challenge for anybody, I think. Um, and it's one that, um, yeah, I, <laughs> hats off to West Government for thinking they can do it. So what are public goods? Let's just deal with that to start off. Um, well, I think it's very important to say that it's a technical term. It has a specific meaning. So it's not... Um, the common use of these words, maybe. Maybe that's part of the, the difficulty with it. So it doesn't mean, for example, things which are good for the public. Um, it doesn't even mean um, things which are the objectives of public policy. It means something else. It means goods and services for which there's no market possible. Um, these are things for which uh, one consumer can't stop another one using it, and one consumer's use of it um, doesn't reduce the amount that's available to another person. There's no market possible. Um, so it's very important we're not talking here about things for which there's no demand. Um, so I just thought I'd give you an example. This is the, the first commercial oil well, a Drake's well in Pennsylvania. Um, but it wasn't the first um, well that was being dug. The wells before was being dug for water. Um, and the oil was just a pain, really. So um, Oil wasn't a public good at that point. Uh, just there was no demand for oil. And so once the demand came for oil, then it was easy enough to make it into a private good. So one person consumption of oil stopped another person using it and people could restrict the availability of oil, etc. Okay, so that's very different from the kind of things we're talking about in this project, which are real public goods. Having said that, it's quite clear from the example that things can be uh, private goods one day and not a private good the other day, uh, but equally public good one day and not a public good the other day. So for example, there's some public goods um, for which a private market can be developed due to changing circumstances. Um, so one example that's very um, current today is the concept of payments for ecosystem services. And so that nowadays there's a woodland carbon code and there's a peatland code which, okay, in certain circumstances only, but still, 
can pay you for delivering what were in the past public goods in the, um, in this case, um, carbon sequestration. Um, eco labels would be a, another example um, where um, public goods can be privatized. Um, government also can create the market, of course, for public goods. And this is, in fact, the, the, um, the game in our project, isn't it? Um, to turn something for which there's no market into something that there's a market for through results-based payments. So the government is making the market in that case. Um, another term you'll hear is ecosystem services. Uh, and so we're in the all dogs are animals, all animals are dogs kind of thing here. Um, so public goods are all ecosystem services, but there's some ecosystem services, food, for example, which are not public goods because there's a market for them. Um, you also hear um, the word externalities used sometimes, so things which are um, external to the, um, the private business, uh, either cost to the businesses or um, either negative um, impacts by the business or positive impacts by the business, which don't reflect in the business's balance sheet. That's quite a, a useful um, way to think about things sometimes. So it's a, a concept that's fairly easy to state, um, but sometimes it's not really clear whether things are public goods or not, uh, despite the, the concept in principle being um, really simple. So one thing that um, can be a factor in that is the time frame. Um, so consider this, um, consider soil, the preservation of soil. Is preservation of soil, is that a, a public good or a private good? Um, so on the left here, we see the dust bowl. Uh, and so the agricultural practices of that time and other factors, of course, um, impacted on the people there within their lifetime. So within the lifetime of their business. So you could say there that um, there's certainly some, um, it's not just a wholly negative externality, it's internal also to the business. Um, but this is that famous poll in the fens. Um, so the top of the, the pole used to be at the top of the peat, and now the peat has eroded and it's down here and it's still eroding. Uh, and so the oxidation of peat is quite clearly uh, an externality to the uh, farmers of the fen. Um, so should we then consider soil to be a public good or a private good? It's not very clear. And what about something in the middle? This is um, Stonehaven in Cardinshire. Um, on a day when the soil was blowing. So I've been twice, I used to live in Scotland, I, I've been twice to Aberdeen Airport, I didn't go there often, and twice of those times there was soil drifting and there was soil drifts in the, the roads. So for all farmers say that the soil is their, uh, it's their bank and all that, well, it was external enough to those businesses for them to afford for it to, to fly around. So what do we say then? So there's a time factor there of when the costs become due, as you might say. Um, another example I just want to put out there, I'm, I'm not intending to answer it really, but what about the number of farmers? Um, does that have a, a benefit society beyond the, the economics of the farmers alone? Um, is it linked to things we might value? And if so, is that in itself a, a public good? Um, people who know me know I'm very fond of Engels law. Um, so Engel was a, uh, an economist, and he noticed that as society gets richer, the proportion of wealth it spends on the products of farming, we can say it that way, reduces. Um, it might increase in absolute terms, but it reduces in um, relative terms. And so farming's purchasing power is always falling behind that of society as a whole. Um, and that means that farmers are less able to participate in the... Um, the increasing affluence of society, the increasing opportunity of society as society gets ever richer. Uh, and what farming has done, of course, over the years is to try and address that by having fewer farmers. So there's been farm amalgamations. Um, but where does that lead? What's the implications of this? Um, I was quite disappointed, actually, in the, in the discussion of the, um, the Welsh policy, that the question of whether we should have farming support at all, um, in general, I mean, um, was all linked to um, volatility. Well, yeah, volatility is one thing, but this thing is more fundamental than volatility. Um, and it's something that nobody seems to want to talk about. So 
that's a that's something for another day but it's something that should be in the background of people's mind in the back of people's mind i think when discussing what a public good really is and whether we can limit it to this strict strict definition that being said these are the public goods that we considered uh, at least in passing so we consider the safe carrying of skills uh, and of other intangible resources um, we considered animal health and biosecurity um, I should just say there what we mean by that. So we're not just talking about the, the health of the farmer's own animals, which should be clearly a, a private good, um, but we're talking about uh, whether, um, whether other, other people's animals on a common um, can catch diseases. Um, we're talking about the use of, uh, the level of use of, of animal health products, for example, and which may have implications for water supply and which has implications for um, resistance to products, all that kind of thing. So these are all things which are um, not really internal to the, uh, the economy of the farm um, at any point, but are a general um, good for society. Uh, we thought about the protection of historical and archaeological remains. Um, commons are, are very important for them because, of course, they haven't been um, agriculturally improved um, over potentially millennia. Uh, we thought about public health, access and recreation. Um, so some of the areas we're talking about in South Wales have um, much worse um, health outcomes than the average in Wales. And there's clearly, I think, a, a link between um, health and the enjoyment of the, of the, the area and commons. Uh, so commons make up, in some cases, 90%, 95% of the open access land in those areas, for example. Um, landscape, I mean, the commons are, are all in, more or less all anyway, in landscapes that people appreciate, um, whether it's locally or nationally or internationally even. Um, we thought about fire risk management. We thought about water quality in its various aspects. We thought about the, the regulation of water flow. And of course, we talked about, um, thought about biodiversity and carbon sequestration and storage. So I, I'm going to go through those. I'm not going to go through them in that order. I'm going to go through in an order that allows me not to repeat myself too much. Uh, but we'll go through them and see how we consider them all. Um, so we decided on reflection that there was some um, public goods um, which were not really um, suitable for fitting into results-based area payments. So we're not saying here that these things are not important. We're not saying necessarily they're not very important. We're just saying that they're not amenable um, for fitting into results-based area payments. Um, and so the safeguarding of skills was one such thing. Uh, and the protection of historical and archaeological remains, which is very, very um, site-related. Some places have lots of sites, some places have apparently none. Um, it's very difficult to generalize that. Public health access restoration, we couldn't see in landscape also, we couldn't really see um, how to make um, area related um, criteria um, or ones that related to the, the farming management. It wasn't very clear what the link was really. Um, so we left those on the side. Um, and then also the animal health and biosecurity um, aspect, we, it's clearly important. Um, and I think probably will get more important as time goes on. That's the message we were getting from Westwater, for example. Um, but again, it's not something that really relates to areas. Um, so what we propose is that there should be a complementary um, health plan um, paid for, and that, that it maybe even should be mandatory for people wanting to avail themselves of the area payments, but it's not something that we thought we could include into the area payment um, itself. So let's start with, with ones that we did think about uh, that we could in include in theory payments. Um, so water flow regulation. So what do we mean by that? Well, it's quite simple if you think about it. Um, water comes in um, discrete showers, maybe heavy showers, maybe longer periods of rain, but they're discrete. Um, and we don't want the water flow in the rivers to reflect the way that the rain comes in. We want there to be water all year round, um, and we don't want there to be um, violent flood events, extreme flood events, if we can at all avoid it. We don't want to reduce the amount of water. I think that's quite important to say, 
Um, you'd think sometimes speak, you know, listening to some people talk that you want to reduce the amount of water, you don't. It's what is a valuable resort, it's no good to man or beast up in the sky. Um, so we don't want to reduce it, we just want to have it spread out evenly throughout the seasons. Um, and so the way to achieve that is to slow down its flow, basically. Uh, if possible, you want the water to be infiltrating into the ground. Um, and if you can't infiltrate it into the ground, or if you if too much comes um, that you haven't got the capacity for it to infiltrate, then you want to slow its its course down through the catchment. So you want to slow it going to the river. Uh, and once it goes into the river, you want to slow the flow of the river. Um, and you want to make the river um, spill out so that the, the flood wave doesn't um, travel or is attenuated as it travels down the catchment, all these kind of things. So that's what you want. Um, and these are all achievable by land management, or, or at least can be contributed to significantly by land management. So this is a picture from Dartmoor, which I stole it's from some Elms uh, trial in Dartmoor. But there's some overland flow in that um, catchment. Uh, and clearly, it's it's not coming from this bit that we're looking at. It's coming from further above. Um, but this section of land isn't doing much um, to stop it because the vegetation is is really short. And so it's quite clear that the the height of vegetation is at least a factor. Um, but how um, how exactly does that work? Do we have any information? Uh, well, fortunately, we do. Um, so I apologize for this graph which I made up from some. Um, data from America, um, but I'll try and explain it to you. Um, so the speed which water um, goes to the river is related to the roughness of the catchment. So the rougher the catchment is, uh, the slower the water gets to the river. Um, so roughness here is in the, the, the red scale, and that's these bars here. And then what we're looking at is um, how high the vegetation is compared to the height of the water. So this vegetation is half the height, this vegetation is the full height, this is twice the height, and this is a lot of vegetation, twice the height. Uh, and what, you see, what we see is that the, the roughness or the, the amount to which it slows the water um, rises very quickly. Um, but then what happens is actually that it, it um, plateaus off. And that's kind of common sense if you think about it. So if the vegetation is twice the height of the water, um, then that does a lot of slowing down. And having it three three times or 10 times, that doesn't really make that much difference. That's kind of common sense, really, if you think about it. Um, so what does that mean? Well, if we were thinking about the, the earlier slide, the water is only an inch deep, two inches deep at most. So twice the height is only four inches. So we're not talking about some um, abandoned catchment here or some really rank catchment. In the right place, just a short amount of vegetation makes a big difference for, for water flow. Uh, but of course, if we're talking next to the, the stream or on the floodplain, then a higher amount of, of water maybe is, is uh, of vegetation is beneficial, a, a higher height of vegetation. Um, so it's horses with courses, but it's not something that's um, completely outrageous. We're not talking anything um, that's really unexpected or that asks for um, huge changes to the catchment. Um, I had a, a field visit to um, Fairwood with some colleagues from uh, NRW. Um, and there, there was a, an online map that um, had been made that suggested that certain areas of the catchment should be planted with trees to stop, um, to stop floods. But it was really obvious when you went there that that wasn't needed at all. The, the areas we're talking about was floodplain and there was um, tussocks of Bolinia there and there was um, uh, some trees there, there was stuff in the stream. It was a really um, well-managed catchment actually for flooding at, in that place. It didn't need the change that was being proposed. Um, and so, yeah, potential, um, the potential of, of managed catchments um, for water flow regulation is really high, I think. We'll turn to biodiversity next. Um, Biodiversity, of course, is the has been the main theme of um, agri-environment schemes, not just in Wales, but almost everywhere else since they started. Um, biodiversity also, um, there's a lot of stuff out there. 
uh, a lot of information and a lot of messages even, or at least that's what you'd think before you started. Um, but when we went uh, looking, we found that the picture was very, very patchy actually. Um, so if we're talking about priority habitats and species on Natura sites, there really is a lot of information. Um, and a lot of it is quantified in um, SSC management plans, for example. But even on a simple triple SI, um, the amount of information is really, really much, much less. Uh, and once we go off these um, designated sites, the area is pretty limited. We have some old um, information from the Biological Survey Common Land, um, which we found really useful, um, and from phase one. But of course, both of these are, are quite old. Um, and some of them are more patchy in quality than others, let's put it that way. Um, so, yeah, it was very limited specific information um, for areas, especially for messages. There was some information, but very, very few clear messages in, on occasion. Of course, we can get some general messages. So the Environment Act is a, a place to look. The Environment Act gives us priority species and priority habitats. Um, and so that gives us um, some pointers, but of course it's an act, so it's not um, very, very detailed. It just gives you an indication of where to look. Uh, similarly, in the um, Wellbeings of Future Generation Act, the things that flowed from that, there's wellbeing indicators. So indicator 43 is about the area of healthy ecosystems, um, which we take to mean semi-natural land mostly. Um, but what does that mean? You know, what does healthy mean? Um, and indicator 44, status of biological diversity, even more vague, uh, one might say. Um, and so it's quite regrettable, I think, even though there's such a large area of it, there's no single place we can go to find a, an overall vision for upland habitats. So we had to make one up, basically, based on what we understood things to mean. Um, and sometimes we had to fill in some gaps. Um, you might be saying, you know, well, what about species? Well, okay, we, we, we take on board that the species are the priorities. Um, but in general, our, our line, I think, would be that we're trying to manage habitats right. Um, and we're trying to provide a, a baseline or a, um, a foundation on which um, adjustments for species can take place. Um, and in some cases, we know that species are um, traditionally rather overlooked. So things like fungi and invertebrates, for example. Um, but we tried to take that into consideration when we were thinking about um, what the health of, of habitats look like. Um, and indeed, some of the things that we might do for fungi and invertebrates will tie in to some of the other public goods. Although um, I just said that um, specific messages uh, sometimes not very clear. I think the broad ones are rather clear, actually. Um, not just from Welsh government um, publications, but from wider things, Lawton Report, for example. Um, so much like a doctor, um, first do no harm, so protect first what you have, um, and then restore. So working with nature and nature's processes, nature-based solutions, as they say. So well, First, we go to nature-based solutions for nature itself also. Um, and then as a last resort, um, create or recreate. Um, we know what the priority habitats are. So those are some of the ones um, that exist on, on commons. And commons are important for them. Um, and they include, of course, semi-natural woodland. But woodland isn't um, privileged there. It's just one amongst um, many other habitats. Uh, so restoring, what does restoring mean? Well, we think it means anyway, um, improving the conditions of the remaining ones. Um, and condition in this case includes structure. So we're not talking about just having, um, for example, in the case of Heathland, we're not talking about having uniform heights of heather everywhere. That's not a, a good result. We need to have structure and the structure at all scales, at the plot scale, at the landscape scale, all scales. It means sometimes reversing changes in vegetation communities where that priority habitat maybe existed before. So maybe now things are acid grassland where they were, you know, within perhaps historic times, within memory even, um, heathland, let's say. 
um, or uh, things which were, you know, are now drained bogs that can be restored to be bogs, whatever, things like that. Um, and then finally, of course, there's a question of uh, reconnecting habitat networks. So most of the habitats we have um, are poorly connected to other habitats. Um, and woodland, of course, would be one of the, the main ones that is um, disconnected in that way. And then, as I say, um, where habitat management isn't enough, then we need to target additional um, action for species. <clears throat> but we don't address that in our, in our uh, measure. What we suggest in our measure um, is that we describe what we're paying for um, so that it's very clear what can be added onto the top of it. Okay, let's turn to carbon sequestration and storage. Um, so I thought I'd start this way. Uh, there's only two places in the planet that sequester carbon nonstop. Uh, so one of them is bogs. Um, in this case, it's um, deltas or whatever with um, anoxic soils, whatever, but it's a bog. It's a kind of bog. Uh, and that results in coal, obviously. And then the other place is the deep ocean floor where um, shells and all that are, and muds um, are falling down and accumulating over the, the years. And of course, within that, uh, there's also oil is formed, um, but that's also on the, on the deep ocean floor. So that's it. There's no other places where carbon sequesters nonstop. I think that's quite an important thing to keep in the back of our minds when we hear all these different narratives about what we should do for carbon. Um, so I chose two sites, of course, to show you that, um, which are in commons. They're surrounded by commons. So this is, uh, this is near Dolice, obviously. So this is uh, Muthur and Gettiger common here. And there's more commons up here. Um, and this is um, Treville, so um, Sangunida and um, Treville Lass and all these places here. Um, and I thought I should make the point also that um, in the picture we see um, the, big, the big problems that cause climate change, okay? Um, and what we see that causes big climate change is um, modern urban, or not urban, modern society and with all its um, use of carbon and the things that it uses to um, fulfill its demands, okay? So it, the fuel it uses, and the building material and all this kind of thing. So commons that are in the rest of the picture are not a major cause of any of the problems, uh, but I think it's also fair to say that they're not the major um, solution either. I think that's something we need to, to keep in our mind when we're thinking about um, what to do on commons. Um, as we'll see in the next photo, um, even healthy bogs sequester carbon very slowly, um, but they do sequester them. So they're the only terrestrial um, ecosystems that do it nonstop. Um, salt marsh, it does accumulate carbon actually very well, um, but of course it's limited um, by sea level, by erosion or whatever. Um, and so um, when you look, there's a really useful report produced by Natural England this year on carbon sequestration and stores in different habitats. Um, it's very strange. The salt marsh has a very high accumulation rate uh, and a very low total. Um, and I think that's how to understand that. Um, but whatever about salt marsh, everything else, so whether it's grasslands, whether it's heaths, whether it's woodlands, in the end, they reach an equilibrium. None of them are continuously uh, sequestering carbon. So the woodland fans and the grassland fans sometimes tell you otherwise, but you show me the, um, the thousand feet of rocks that's generated from woodland or from grassland, they don't exist. Uh, and so it seems quite clear that uh, these aren't the places really to solve society's problems. So one of the things that's quite interesting is that the stores are quite huge compared to the sequestration rates. Um, and in fact, the well-being indicator, the National Wellbeing Indicator 13, um, is one that concerns itself with the concentration of carbon and organic matter in soils. So this is just a, a picture to illustrate what I mean. This is actually County Durham, but it doesn't matter. It's the same thing. 
Um, so peat, according to the Natural England report, which I just talked about, um, that stores maybe 800 tons of carbon per hectare. Of course, it depends on the depth. It could be uh, less, but it could, in Lewis or somewhere like that, it could be more. So how does that compare to the, um, the rates of change? Well, uh, an eroding bog, such as the one we see in the picture, I suppose, um, releases, according to Natural England, um, between 3 and 13 tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent per hectare per year. Um, so carbon dioxide is 27% carbon. So, okay, it's just, a, it's just a rough thing, but let's say um, it releases between 0.7 and 2.5 tonnes of carbon equivalent per hectare per year. So it's um, not a huge amount compared to the, the amount that is in the bog. So that bog might last 400 years, 300 years, something like that. But it's, yeah, it's significant. And if we want to address increased um, carbon in the environment, then, of course, stopping it um, is a good idea. What about sequestration? Well, in sequestration, the, the story is uh, of a different uh, order of magnitude, really. So if that bog was actively growing, it would sequester, according to Natural England, about 0 0.02 tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent per hectare per year. Um, so if we divide that by four, then we come to 0 0.05 tonnes of carbon per hectare per year, which is five kilos. So five kilos over a hectare per year. That's the size of the effect we're talking about. Um, and so I'm not saying it shouldn't be done for carbon reasons, but there's plenty of other reasons that we could be thinking of for restoring peatlands. Sorry, it's the wrong way. Just to put that into some sort of scale, so burning one tonne of coal, like we saw in Dole S there, uh, means oxidizing at least 0.7 tonnes of carbon. So that's um, actively growing peat bog, which we've restored. Uh, it would take 140 hectares of that to accumulate that in one year. Or put another way, it would take one hectare 140 years to accumulate that. So this is the kind of scale of things we're talking about. Um, two things to note there, that stopping erosion makes a bigger difference than sequestration in the short term. Um, but the second thing to note is that it's, it's not doesn't touch the sides when it comes to the changes the society needs to make. I think that's quite important to say. The other thing that the Natural England um, report um, pointed out, and this was actually a bigger surprise to me than the first thing, was that most of the carbon is in the soil, not vegetation. That's really obvious when you're talking about a peat bog, um, but they weren't saying it was just like that for peat bogs. They were saying it was like that for most organic soils. Um, so for example, this is um, a piece of data from the, the report. Um, this chap, Ossel, and, and his colleagues, or her colleagues, looked at dwarf shrub heath. Um, so Heather Moland, if you like to put it that way. Um, and they found that in the above ground vegetation, there was two tons of carbon per hectare. But in the soil, there was 88 tons of carbon per hectare. So it's completely different order of magnitude. I was really, really surprised at that. Uh, and so when we're talking about vegetation change, potentially, um, with regard to, to adjusting to climate, it's very easy to think of that um, one foot of, of heather and think, oh, how we could replace that with 10 foot of tree or whatever, for example. But if that 10 foot of tree means releasing just a proportion of this carbon that's in the soil, then that changes the um, equation completely. Uh, and whatever about that, it's, it's really obvious then that the, the thing that's really important is to protect the carbon that's in the soil. Not necessarily to try to increase it, or um, not as the first priority anyway, um, but to protect it. So soils vary in their, in their carbon. And one of the interesting things in that same report was how low um, it is in, in calcareous grassland, which kind of, when you think about it, makes sense. 
and also on the back end that was quite low um, and so if we want to protect the Harris class one I think we have to say well we are making a compromise here between the maximum amount of carbon storage um, and um, managing this important and rare um, habitat for biodiversity but in most cases actually it's really quite surprising um, there's very little compromise that needs to be made. And that's also the case um, for woodlands. Um, so there's places where woodlands might expand, um, but for the most part, it's not really obvious at all that woodlands are the way to increase carbon stores, net carbon stores, um, and that biodiversity has to some, somehow compromise um, to allow woodland to be planted. Um, and not just biodiversity, of course, but in the case of um, coniferous plantations, water quality, um, siltation, all sorts. So that was a real surprise. That was one of the, um, the main surprises of this work, I think, for me anyway, um, to realise actually that there was a, a consistent um, picture, coherent picture, a coherent vision that could be made where you didn't have to have a big conflict between biodiversity uh, and carbon issues. Okay, um, well, let's move on then to, to fire risk management. Um, so there's a number of things that um, came up when we were thinking about this. So one of the things is that um, fires are not all of equal risk. They're not of equal importance for, um, for addressing. Um, obviously, fires that um, threaten life and limb are very, very important. And also um, domestic and industrial forest um, property and forestry plantations, they cause a lot of, of costs if they get going. Um, fires can disrupt busy roads. Um, they can um, damage sensitive habitats. Um, so bogs particularly are very sensitive to, to fire damage. And, and of course, there's um, the danger they cause to the emergency services themselves. There's a whole range of fires which are um, really high risk. Um, but some are, are lower risk, if we're, if we're really honest about it. Um, but when we think about um, managing fires, it's not just a matter of simple prevention. Um, those of you that have heard the, the Fire and Rescue Services um, give public talks, um, this will have, will have really struck you like it struck me. Um, so in the, the South Wales um, fire and Rescue Service, the policy is to reduce the number of fires. Um, and what that's led to is to have uh, very, very, um, a lot less fires, a lot, a lot fewer number of fires. But those fires that happen then become really large and dangerous. Uh, and so it's a matter of managing fuel loads rather than simple prevention. And if you think about it, um, a low fuel load common, um, for example, is a common that's grazed like a bowling green. Um, but that's not good for a wide range of biodiversity and certainly not good for water flow regulation, as we discussed earlier. Um, and at the opposite end of a spectrum, um, a high fuel load common, um, of course, has got lots of dense rank vegetation, but that's not usually ideal either for biodiversity and maybe not for other things like public access. Um, so we're talking about some sort of spectrum here, aren't we? Um, where the, um, you know, this, this is a, a part, part of one common that's in our area. Uh, and that part of that common has a low fuel load. Um, but whereas it's great for some things, it's, yeah, it's not good for, for lots of other things. Um, and this is another common that's in our patch, um, a common that, um, has been unused for a while. It's just getting back into use now. And there the fuel load is huge, um, but it's also impacting on biodiversity and other things. Um, so can't we then include it quite simply into our um, area payment? Isn't there some criteria we can use to incorporate it? Uh, well, we, th we did think about it. We did talk to some people about it. Um, but it seems that the answer is no, really. Um, and part of the reason is, sh is shown in these diagrams here. So all three of these have half, half black, so high, half high fuel and half um, low fuel. 
Um, but common sense tells you that a fire in any of these um, will progress really very different. <coughs> excuse me, very differently. Um, some will have potentially catastrophic fires, and some will have fires that are easy to isolate and to control. Um, and that's just on a, a flat plane. And what the fire service tells us, of course, is that there's other factors which are also very important. So um, aspect, for example, or slope. Um, so things which have a, a very strong spatial element, um, which we just can't uh, accommodate into a very simple uh, uh, set of criteria for area payments. Um, even though we can quite clearly see that there's uh, links with some of the other things that we're talking about. Um, and so, okay, we're, we're aware, I think, that fire risk management is a compromise. Um, or it's a, it's, a, it's a thing that comes about because we're compromising with the needs of other public goods. Um, we need to have a certain amount of structure for biodiversity. We need to have a certain amount of vegetation growth um, for um, water flow management. Uh, and so it's a matter of coping with the amount of fuel that those things need. Um, to benefit the whole suite of public goods um, without putting um, lives and habitats and all these things in danger. But what that means, in fact, is very place specific. And so it's not really very easily fitted into a general results based um, area payment. So what we suggest uh, is very similar to what we suggested for animal health, actually. So we're suggesting that. Um, there should be support for a fire management plan. I think that's something that the fire and rescue services um, would support. Um, but also for management actions that arise from that. And of course, that those management actions can be thought of um, and incorporate some of these other um, public good needs um, that we've been talking about before. So you would think about where you would have your low fuel area. So is it far away from a stream, for example? Uh, things like that. Uh, and that there should also be funding and help for capacity building, I think, and collaboration with the emergency services. Um, I think that would be a very positive thing. Those of us who have been down to Dartmoor and see the, the sterling work um, between um, Devon Somerset Fire and Rescue Services and um, some of the Dartmoor commoners are really impressed by it. And I think there's um, scope for doing similar things in Wales. Okay. Let's talk now then about water quality. Um, so in water quality in, in on common land we're talking about now, so we're not talking about industry and um, domestic um, uh, sewers or whatever, we're talking about semi-natural areas. Um, but still there's a number of issues um, that arise and they have very um, a lot of variation in their significance in different catchments. Um, so one is peat. Um, sorry, is colour. Um, so colour is subject to rules, um, partly because of perception, I think. I don't think there's any harm to it to anybody, but it's mostly peat related. Um, and it's linked to things like peat erosion or um, the, the wetting and drying of peat. Uh, and so addressing things to do with that um, also tie into to biodiversity. And they also tie into carbon sequestration. So that's something that would be, uh, well, potentially dealt with with some of these other things. Um, then there's smell and taste. So that um, usually in our catchment is related to Brugin algae. It's not quite clear how. Um, apparently there's work being done. I see Nigel is in the, in the, in the room, so Maybe Nigel's had the report now, but there's work being done in the um, some of the Beacons catchments area um, to study how exactly that, that works. Um, then there's sediment issues. So sediment clearly fills up reservoirs. Um, it can cause um, problems that, uh, that um, lead to flooding long-term downstream. Um, and sediment is often, of course, point source. Um, and it's something that's not particularly beneficial. The, the places that generated aren't particularly beneficial necessarily for biodiversity or anything else. Um, so there's no, there's no conflict there. Um, cryptosporidium is a, is a particular challenge. That's a much more serious challenge. Um, so whereas the other ones are just um, 
things for which there's a certain level expected, and if the level changes, then that's an issue. But for cryptosporidium, there's a zero tolerance, really. Uh, and so that comes, that's an organism that comes from feces, um, livestock feces, whatever. Um, but that's related to some extent um, to how easily the, the feces gets into the water. So it doesn't need the animal to be standing in the water. Um, it could be going in overland flow, for example. Um, and so some of these things we've talked about earlier, about controlling overland flow, um, about, um, oh, we didn't mention it, I should have mentioned it perhaps, uh, but things like um, blocking ditches, um, that's good for, for water flow regulation, essential actually for water flow regulation, um, but that also could be stopping cryptosporidium going to reservoirs. Um, and then there's other things down the road potentially, um, which may become issues. Um, agricultural chemicals, agricultural medicines. Um, so these are things that um, we talked about to some extent, some of them, uh, when we talked about animal health and pet security. And so there's there's potential uh, links in there. And I know Welsh Water are, are speaking to people in the um, Brecon Beacons mega catchment about uh, the use of medicines, thinking of starting a project on that. So there's, there's links to lots of the things we've been talking about. Um, and as I say, sometimes, um, the challenge is any time that something occurs, but sometimes it's just predictability. So they don't want larger, uh, they don't want larger, oof, sorry, they don't want a large variation. They want things to be predictable so that the uh, um, processing, the uh, treatment plants can cope with it. Uh, so there's some clear messages, I think. Um, addressing erosion of peat and peaty soil is a good thing. And that's a good thing for other reasons, as we said. Minimizing and slowing down overland flows is a good thing. Um, and it's a good thing for other reasons, as we said. Uh, and so water quality is benefited by measures for carbon, for biodiversity, um, and for, uh, let me just admit somebody, and for water flow regulation. Um, we've also discussed before that collaborative biosecurity and animal health planning is a good thing. Um, and so there's a lot of um, complementarity here. Um, but as such, we haven't addressed it specifically on the card. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty still. Um, and if it was to be the case that um, more clarity came um, that might warrant changing a card, then so be it. Um, but just now, we're not um, seeing that. Um, and what we propose, of course, is some help with Commons by Security Animal Health Plan, as we discussed earlier. So to summarize what's in the, um, the final card, um, we have considerations of biodiversity, of course, in it. Um, we have considerations that are linked to carbon sequestration and storage and to water flow management. Um, and to some extent, um, indirectly, we have criteria which link to fire risk management and water quality, but which don't fully address them. Um, and so we suggest there should be some standalone planning. Um, if it has to be even separate from um, accessing the area payment. And in all cases, I think there's um, potential for useful um, complementary capital works and for capacity building and advice. That's really obvious. And so the last slide, I think, um, to summarize. So I think rather to my surprise, we found no fundamental conflict between any of the public goods, um, not even the climate change one. Um, and we found no fundamental conflict between any of the public goods and responsible grazing, actually. Um, quite the reverse, we found for most cases that there was a strong case that a certain level of grazing management um, and its accompanying practices can deliver high levels of all these public goods and to deliver them together, actually. Having said that, we don't think that everything is easily converted into an area payment. Um, but having said that, a well-constructed area payment, results-based area payment, um, gives a strong signal as to what's desirable and also provides a strong and sympathetic base on which to build other things, whether they be targeted action-based works, um, standalone strategies and actions based on those, or training and advice and collaborative working. Uh, I think that's the, yeah, that's the end of it.
Okay, thanks very much. Um, there's an opportunity, there's time left for, for some questions if, if people have questions. Um, and while people are thinking about that, um, I'll just tell you what the, what's coming up. So next week, uh, the same time, but with a different link, it's in the same email, the second one down. Um, we'll be talking about um, how we convert this picture of what policy wants into a payment rationale. Um, which we want to use to encourage and reward progress in those directions. Uh, and just to, to forewarn you that on the 12th of October, there'll be the end of project webinar, so it'll be less heavy, <laughs> I'd be glad to know, uh, than these evening talks. Uh, and that'll happen between um, two and four. And if you've had uh, a link from us for this, then we'll be sending a, a link to you in your email. Uh, for that. So the link will hopefully be out this week or next. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing now. And if there are any questions, then by all means, put them in the chat or, um, yeah, let us know somehow else that you want to raise them. Okay, comment was there none. Ah, okay. Where can I watch the lecture? Uh, okay, um, a good question uh, from Berglund in uh, Iceland. Welcome. Um, so I'll be putting up, uh, I'll be putting it into a YouTube video. Um, so it might even happen tonight, but in the next few days anyway, and it'll go up on the EFNCP YouTube channel. But there'll there'll be a notice about it in the um, on the Facebook page, so um, payment. But oh, yeah, what's the <laughs> what's the name of it? I'll I'll put a link to the to the Facebook page in the in the chat now, um, so they get it right. Okay, so I put the, the link to the Facebook page in the chat. Okay, so if there's no other question, we'll draw it to a, a close for tonight. Um, thanks for coming. Um, thanks for uh, Tony, thanks to Tony Little for making the, the technical side work. Um, and hopefully see you next week. Thanks very much.